the past few days I've had this, this theme in my heart. You know, the heartbeat of heaven is revival. And in case you don't know, you've been planted in a revival church. You're planted in a house where God has ordained and anointed pastors to look at the book of Acts, to look what Jesus laid out in the Gospels, and and that's the foundation. That was revival. What, What is revival? I had this picture in my mind of what revival is. I've never seen this in person, maybe some of you have, but I've seen it on the movies, so that's good enough, right? In the movies, when when people die in the hospital, they they try to bring back the person by whipping out a defibrillator. You you ever seen those? They, They look pretty scary. And they place it on the body to shock the body, really to shock the heart in hopes of reviving that person back to life. So that's one mental picture that I had of revival. Another is when someone is swimming and they ended up drowning and they bring them out of the water and what do they do? They, they put their, their lips on the lips of, of the person that has drowned and is now dead and they, they breathe breath, they blow breath into them in hopes of reviving them back to life. And that's what revival does. God is, he, he's breathing his, his breath into his church, into his bride. And I was thinking about Adam. When God created Adam, what did he do? He created him from the dust of the earth. But then he took Adam and he breathed his pneuma, his breath, the spirit of God into Adam. And Adam, he became a living being. And so what revival is, it's the breath of God into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing his church back to life. Amen. Now that should be a constant. But mankind has this tendency to always go back to religion and tradition. And so what revival does is it keeps the church alive. And so we need revival every single day. If if you're not waking up in the morning and saying, Lord, I need a fresh dose of the Holy Spirit today, then listen, you're going to be missing it. God gives the kingdom to those who recognize that without him, they're nothing. Without him, we can bear no fruit. You you actually have to have a, 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 a poverty spiritual mentality. That without God, I'm nothing. So I need God for every breath that I take. Jesus said that he could not bear fruit without the Father. So you need God in order to bear fruit. So we need revival. America desperately needs revival. And when when the church is revived, full of life, it becomes salty. How many of you like salt? Come on now, this is Louise. Do I have to go down south? We don't just like salt, we like Tony's. Tony Sashery. How many of you use Tony Sashery? How many of you use it on ice cream? Don't raise your hand. That's weird. <laughs> A strange fire. <laughs> but God revives his church to be the light and to be the salt of the earth. And when the church is salty, it begins to influence the seven mountains that actually shape and mold society. What are those? Uh, Religion, belief system, if you will. That's a big deal. And for a long time, uh, Christianity, that belief system, shaped America. How about family, government, business? education, arts, and media. The church is meant to influence those seven mountains which shape society. And we've had some great awakenings in the past that that really shaped American culture. A lot of the verbiage that we use today, the, the vernacular comes from the Bible. 
The Bible literally shaped America for, for a couple centuries, at least, and obviously there's been a, a departure from that, but we need to get back to that place where we are the salt of the earth again. If any of you had heard uh, Rodney Howard Brown's testimony, how many of you were, were there at, at Faith Church when Rodney came to, to Ruston? Rodney talked about how he had this vision where the fire of God appeared before him and the Lord spoke to him and revealed to him that the church was not ready for the Great Commission. The church was not ready. God places the fivefold ministry gifts in the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher to equip the church for the work of the ministry. So everybody is called to ministry. If you didn't know it, now you do. You're all anointed for worship and ministry. Amen. It's important. You know, the military, they actually do drills to be prepared for battle. Well, this place is an equipping place. This place is a place where you can come and encounter God. This is a place where you, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You, you begin to speak in, in tongues as the Bible teaches. You, you get filled with the power of God. You, you learn, you see the, the, the laying on of hands. You see the preaching of the word of God. You, you see worship taking place in here. You see people getting healed. We've got wonderful testimonies of what God has. This is the place where we see what the church looks like. This is what you look like. This is what you should look like as you go out, that you are a representation of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, America needs revival. It desperately needs revival. When, when you have the government looking at the American citizen as an enemy of the United States, you know that we are in dire times. How many of you saw January 6th where they called it an insurrection? It's really a fedsurrection, if you will. There was 200 federal agents in the crowds of the people who were protesting, which is our right. It's our right to protest. And they were there because they're hoping that our government will follow the laws on the books. That's why they were there. They're hoping for fair elections. And if that's what you're standing for, the government looks at you as an enemy of the United States. And these feds actually stirred up people in the crowds to go into the Capitol. So think about that. That's entrapment. The government is seeking to entrap Americans, good-hearted people who don't want to see this nation destroyed, stirred them up to go into the Capitol, arrested them, put them in prison, and there's no court date. There's no hope. So many of these people have committed suicide. The government did that. Made them do that. So we need revival desperately in America. And God is looking at his church. He's looking at his church. So many people think that, you know, if, if, if Trump will get in the office, he'll fix everything. Or maybe Mike Johnson becoming the Speaker of the House. Maybe he'll fix things. And already I'm going, hey, Mike, what's going on here? Some of these decisions that you have already made in the first week. Why are we looking to support Ukraine? Israel seems to have it going on. Why do we need to send so much money over there when we're in debt, $34 trillion? What if we focused on America? There's a novel idea. But people are looking for something on the external to fix the problem. But God is looking to deal with the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is the heart's of Americans. And when God begins to deal with the nation, he always begins in the church. 
he begins in his own house. So God is looking to raise up people that will carry the revival fire of God. But he's looking for people who will yield, surrender, and allow God to purify our hearts first. He wants to begin in our hearts to prepare us to be a vessel that he can use for his glory. So today I want to talk about the issues of the heart. Can we, can we go there today? Like so many, we like to talk about revival and go and do the, the healing and the preaching and the ha. But it's like, well, God, God wants to deal with our hearts. There was a man named Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. And he was the commander of the army of Syria. He was a, a great warrior, but he had leprosy. And the Syrian army had gone out on raids, and they would collect things that did not belong to them and take it back to their own nation. And they collected a young lady who became the maid of the wife of Naaman. She was an Israelite. And she told Naaman's wife that if Naaman would go to the king, or if Naaman would go to Israel and find the prophet, that he would be healed of his leprosy. So Naaman went to the king of Syria and told him what this young lady said. And the king said, go, and gave him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of of gold and 10 sets of clothing to give as a gift, along with a letter that read, this is my uh, servant, Naaman, and I want you to heal him of his leprosy. This was sent to the king of Israel. When the king of Israel read this letter, he ripped his clothing and said, am I a God that I can give life and take life of people? He was distraught. And so Elijah heard that the king had torn his clothing, that he was angry, and he said, send him to me. So Naaman comes with his entourage to Elijah's home. And he's standing on the outside of his home. And Elijah doesn't go out and meet him himself. He, he sends his servant. We call these chumps. You ever been called a chump? I've been a chump in ministry for a long time. Pastor Butch's chump, you know. Thomas is Pastor Butch's chump now. It's good to be a chump. Well, he sent the chump out. That's how you grow. So he sends the chump out with a message to Naaman. Lord said, if you'll go to the Jordan River and dip in it seven times, that you'll be healed of your leprosy. And the Bible says that Naaman got angry, and he stormed off. And he said, I thought surely that the prophet would come out and meet me. I mean, doesn't he know who I am? I'm Naaman, the commander of the army of Syria, a great warrior. He said, I thought he would come out and meet me face to face, and he would take his hand and wave it over the leprosy, and he would call upon the name of his God, and I would be healed. So Naaman had a preconceived idea of how God should do something. And I think very often, we have our preconceived ideas about how God should do something, don't we? We see this all throughout the scriptures, where people missed it because they had preconceived ideas. Are you hot? We can turn the AC on. Why don't we get the AC cranking? It's going to get hot in here. We're going to preach it up. Amen. Amen. But so often, we have preconceived ideas, and the, the Israelites... They had cried out for hundreds of years when they were slaves in Egypt. Thank you for that, by the way. They had cried out for years, God, save us. And so God raised up Moses, a deliverer, to go and rescue the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Brings them out of slavery, out of bondage, where they ate things like leeks, and onions, and that was like all that was on the menu. So they're out, they're free from slavery. 
Yet there was this thing that was attached to it. They had to walk by faith. And as they're walking by faith, it is offensive. They're upset because they view God as not taking care of them. When they needed food, they begin to complain. When they needed water, they begin to complain. Even though there was a host of different miracles that God had done that overwhelmingly showed that he was for them and would take care of them. Yet they they just couldn't reconcile this walk of faith. So they were offended with God. They were offended with Moses, the man of God that led them. And so God had to allow this whole generation who had these, who had these preconceived ideas of how God would lead them into the land, the promised land. He had to allow that whole generation to die off, and he had to raise up a new generation to bring into the promised land. Now Israel had, had hoped for the Messiah, that he would come. And they began to intercede and pray. And yet they had preconceived ideas of how the Messiah would come. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he didn't fit their preconceived ideas of what the Messiah would look like. They thought that he would set up this earthly kingdom and he would be seated on his throne and the Jews would would dominate over Rome and over the whole world. They didn't know that Jesus would come healing the sick. They didn't know that, you know, he wouldn't be a Pharisee or a Sadducee. And he spoke of love. He spoke of a spiritual kingdom. And guess what? Many Israelites, they missed out on what God was doing because of their preconceived ideas. Even John the Baptist is sitting in a prison cell, and yet he's trying to reconcile if Jesus is truly the Messiah. Why? Because the Bible said that the Messiah would set the captives free, and here he is in prison. He sent two disciples to meet with Jesus, saying, are you really the Messiah? And he said, go tell John what you see, that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. I find so many people, they have preconceived ideas about how God should do something. Lord, raise up leaders like David. God raises up leaders like David in their midst. And then all of a sudden, you got people who come along with Saul's armor. Hey, we need you to fit in our preconceived idea of what a pastor is supposed to be. Or what a leader is supposed to, you're supposed to fit in this armor. My preconceived idea of what you're supposed to be like. And David, he said, Saul, that armor doesn't fit me. I'm going to go in the identity and the strength, and the calling, and the anointing of what God has placed upon me. Amen. Be careful of preconceived ideas. You know, we, we had mentors at one time who we were trying to get really close to, but we couldn't. And for years, I was so frustrated Uh, We received from them, they had an anointing, but we didn't know until years later that there were some things in their life that God was trying to spare us of. Some lifestyle habits and choices that just didn't line up with kingdom values. But, But we didn't know that until much further in our walk with the Lord. And so we had to just watch so that we wouldn't get offended at what God was doing or trying to keep us from. He was trying to protect us. Amen. And I think so often we have preconceived ideas of what revival should look like. That when revival breaks out, well, people weep. They repent and they weep. That's part of it. But God may move differently from how you're used to. The joy of the Lord may break out in services. And if that's different, that's okay. Amen. Amen. We've just got to go with the flow of what God is doing. If you go back and you study all the revivals, the moves of God that took place in history, 
Every time there was a move of God, God would do something unique and different. Anybody ever hear the, the holy rollers? They would roll around on the floor. And then you had the Quakers. Anybody ever hear the Quakers? They would, they would quake and, and shake. Salt shaker. I shake. I mean, the Bible says that the Lord, he, he looks at the one who trembles at his word. But then something happens. God does something different in the next generation. And I've seen so often where those in the previous generation that had a move of God, they would begin to judge this new thing that God was doing, and they ended up missing out on what God was doing. So be careful that you're not offended with how God moves. Amen. Amen. I find that there are a lot of Christians that God has used in the past to do wonderful things. They brought their families in the church. Their children are serving the Lord. They're big givers. They're servants. God has used them, but all of a sudden, they've gotten offended in life, and now they're stuck. And they can't go any further in their walk with God because they've gotten offended. How many of you know that we live in an age of offense where people get offended for everything? I mean, everything. If you don't, you know, refer to someone as their preferred pronoun, people get offended now. If you say Merry Christmas in New York, people get so offended. They, they don't want to hear the word Christ. Don't say Christmas. It's happy holidays. You'd be surprised. People get offended. What does it mean to be offended? You get upset. You're displeased. You're annoyed. You're resentful, which means you're bitter about something. At its core, being offended is, is a response, a reaction to external stimuli that causes an emotional response on the inside of us. Now, there are legitimate reasons to be offended over something. If somebody teaches your children that they can be the opposite gender of what they are, that's a legitimate reason to be offended. It's a righteous indignation. But we live in a time when people are offended about so much. And you've got to be careful with this offense. Is any of this making sense? <clears throat> a lot of times there's an underlying root of offense. Not all the time. But many times there's an underlying root for being offended. Sometimes they have an anger problem, or there's jealousy, or there's insecurity. How many of you remember the story of when, Ad, uh, not Adam, Cain and Abel, they brought their offerings to God. God received Abel's offering, but didn't receive Cain's offering. And the Lord came to Cain and said, look, you need to check your heart. If you do good, then all will be well for you. Cain had a heart issue. He was angry. He was jealous of the favor of God that was upon Abel. And so he ended up killing his brother. So we've got to check our hearts. I want to talk to you today about offense. Sometimes people come to church and they're offended by somebody or something. If they're not offended with the music, which... I'm, I'm blown away that people would be offended with the music that we sing here. I mean, you'd be surprised. Reasons why people get offended in church. We don't like the music there. Well, let's, let's just go look at the words. I raise a hallelujah. I mean, what, what's offensive about that? You're saying I praise God. But people get offended over the music. If they're not offended by the music, they're offended by the fact that we took up an offering. 
If they're not offended by that, then they're offended by something that we've said or something that we've done. But I've found that right at the doorway to the greatest blessings of God is always a rock of offense. Everything that comes from God has an offense attached to it. I want you to get that in your spirit today. Everything that comes from God has an offense attached to it. Think about salvation. It's attached to Jesus dying on a cross, a bloody cross. Now, for Muslims, it is offensive to think that God would allow himself to be tortured and then murdered by human beings. And so for many Muslims, they can't get over the cross. They're offended by it. And so they don't make it to salvation. How about the blessing of God? Danielle talked about it. It's attached to what? Tithing and offering. You'd be surprised how many Christians are offended by the message of tithe and offering. Maybe they've never read the Bible. I I don't know. But there's this this offense that's attached to the blessing of God. Now, how about this one? Forgiveness of our sins is connected to us forgiving people when they sin against us. It's easy to swallow the pill that God forgives you. But how about forgiving people when they've sinned against you? When when they've done you wrong? That's a tough one. So there's always an offense connected to the things that God wants to give us. God was trying to bring healing to Naaman, and yet there was this thing, this Jordan River that he was instructed to go and dip in seven times. Now, the Jordan River was dirty, a dirty river. And in his mind, he's thinking, there's rivers in Damascus that are much prettier, much nicer, but this Jordan River, it's dirty. It offended his mind. Are you with me? So the Jordan River, this dirty river, was the key to his freedom and his deliverance. Very often the thing that you and I don't want to do is the thing that God wants us to do. And he's looking for you and I to put our pride down, to humble ourselves, and just receive what God is telling us to do. How many of you know it would take great humility, a laying down of pride for Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, to go and dip in a dirty river called Jordan? But thankfully, you know, he stormed off, but thankfully he had some wise servants who talked some sense into him. Today, I'm the servant of the Lord that wants to talk some sense into God's people, to to not be offended. The, the, The thing that looks dirty, forgiving other people. God wants you to lay down your pride, receive what he says, receive his instructions. Just do what God tells you to do, and it will be well for you. Thank God that Naaman, he obeyed the Lord. He went in that dirty Jordan River, and he had to dip not one time, but seven times. I imagine seven times, you know, it was kind of getting to him. Just one, two, this dirty water. But when he came up, that seventh time, he had obeyed the instructions of the Lord, and his skin turned perfectly normal. He was so in awe by what God had done for him that he told his servants, hey, get the shovels, boys. 
I want you to load up a whole mound of dirt, put it in this cart, and let's bring it back to Syria. Because when I get back to Syria, I'm not worshiping Syrian gods. I'm going to worship the God of Israel who is a healer. (laughs) Hallelujah. It pays to obey the Lord. Naaman was a great warrior, but he was a leper. Leprosy is a type of sin in the scriptures. There are people who have done wonderful things for God in their life. Their families have changed. They've been used by God, but they're bound up in a certain area. And God wants to bring freedom to them today. He wants to bring freedom to you. Maybe you're bound up in an area of your life today. Maybe it's, it's, it's not forgiving others who have wronged you. God wants to bring you freedom. Listen, we have to understand that God always requires something from us. He always requires that we lay down our pride our own thoughts, our own ways in order to receive what he has for us today. You know, there's this story in John chapter 9 where Jesus, he encountered a man who was blind, blind from birth. And his disciples came up to him and said, Jesus, this man, he's blind. Was it due to sin in his own life or the sin of his parents? And Jesus basically said, boys, you're asking all the wrong questions. What you need to be asking is what does God want to do for him today? And the Bible says that Jesus, he spit on the ground and he bends down and he picks up the spit. He he, he mingles it with some dirt, some clay, and he makes clay patties, if you will. And he goes up to the blind man and he rubs it in the blind man's eyes. And he gives them this instruction. I want you to go and wash in the pool of Siloam and you will see. Now that man could have turned around and said, you know, I was in one of those Jesus meetings once. And I was blind. But when I left the meeting, I was blind and dirty. Can you believe that man? He spit on the ground and and made a mud patty and he rubbed it in my eyes. Can you see the headlines today? Faith preacher put spit in a blind man's eyes. (laughs) He has no compassion for the blind. He's offensive. Or how about the young man who had incredible wealth? He was a real businessman. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God. In other words, are you, are you calling me God? And Jesus rattles off the commandments for this young man. He says, you know them. Don't commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. 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 Don't steal. And the young man says, well, I've done all these since I was a kid. I was a youth. And Jesus looked at him deep in his eyes. And he located right where he was at. He said, I want you to go and sell everything you had. Everything you had. Because this man, he loved his wealth more than he loved God. He said, I want you to take all your possessions. I want you to sell them. Give them to the poor. And then come and follow me. Now, can you see those headlines today? Faith preacher requires potential follower candidates to sell everything they have, give it to the poor, and follow him. Or how about this one? There was a Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus, and she was pleading for him to heal her daughter. She had demons, and she needed deliverance. And the Bible says that Jesus ignored her. I read that a couple days, and I'm going, Jesus, what's up with that? He ignored her. I mean, that's unlike God. But he ignored this woman. 
who is in need. Which goes to show that God is not moved by need. If he was moved by need, all of Africa would be saved. He's not moved by need. He's moved by faith. And we'll see that illustrated in the story. This woman, she, she, Jesus ignores her. So she turns to the disciples and she begins to beg and plead with them, can you do something then? Finally, they get so annoyed by it, they say, Jesus, <laughs> would you do something? This lady won't stop. She won't leave us alone. So she comes and she kneels at the feet of Jesus and she pleads with him. And Jesus looks at her and says, woman, I need you to get to the back of the line. Because right now, I'm only taking care of the Israelites, God's people, his children. And it's not right to take food from the children's mouth and to give it to the dogs. Skirt! Right there. You know that they would have deplatformed Jesus. He, he would no longer have a social media presence. He'd be taken off of Facebook. He'd be taken off of YouTube. He'd be deplatformed. Everybody would say how Jesus, he's very offensive, and so we need to censor him. PayPal is no longer taking donations for his ministry. They're actually just going to keep all the funds. You know, he would have had to start a GoFundMe account or something. Now, we know that she didn't stop there. She dismissed all of the offense, all the things that, that were seemingly offensive, and she said, yes. But even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus said, woman, great is your faith. Just go ahead and go on about your business. Your daughter's already healed. And she was healed at that very hour. Or how about this one? Jesus has a mega church. Nothing wrong with mega church. Jesus has this mega church. I mean, there's thousands of people that are there. They, they, they ate the bread and, and the fish, and they're drawn to all the miracles. And Jesus brings out his, his message on, on, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, unless I'm your meal, you can have no part of me. And they're like, what? It, is he saying... What I think he's, is, is he talking about cannibalism? Is that, I knew that this guy was, was a false prophet. And Jesus, I mean, he keeps pushing the envelope further and further. And he says later on in his message, when it was too late, because the people, they were already thinking cannibalism, cannibalism. And he said, my words are spirit. I'm, I'm speaking spiritually here. But it was already too late. And the Bible said that they all walked away. The entire mega church walked away from Jesus. And all Jesus had was his 12 disciples that were left. And he looks at them and he says, are you going to leave too? How do you go from having a mega church to 12 people left in the church with one message? You know what that reveals to me? God is not afraid to reveal, sorry, to offend our minds in order to reveal what is in our hearts. God gets to the root of the issue. And I've learned over the years that God puts me in a position to offend my mind. I've always had mentors that had some sort of personality trait that was offensive to my mind. They were too extreme, they preached too long, or whatever it is, fill in the blank. God was always trying to check my heart to see if I would be obedient to him. And I, in my own mind, just for helps, I always look at them and then I look at King Saul who was David's king and mentor, and I think to myself, well, at least I didn't have King Saul as a mentor. King Saul tried to kill David for I don't know how many years, 10, 11, 12 years, chasing him down, and yet Saul, David always looked at Saul 
and he respected and he honored him. God always gets to the root of the issue. He's looking at our hearts. We have to be careful that we're not driven by offense. Because offense will take us out of the will of God. Just real quickly, let me, let me read this to you. Go to Mark. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and verse 14, the Bible says that the sower sows the word. God is sowing his word today in this church. He's sowing it into your hearts. So the sower sows the word, verse 15, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. The devil knows the impact of the word of God sown into a heart that is soft, a heart that is unoffendable. Can I say it that way? He knows the potential of what God's word can do in a heart that is receptive, that is soft, like, like soil. You know, you got to break up the soil and make sure there's no rocks and, and, and thorns in the ground because it'll, it'll choke out growth. It'll choke out fruitfulness. So the enemy, he, he comes along to, to steal Immediately, the word of God that was sown into their hearts. Now look at the second kind of soil. This first one is, is like hard like a road. But look at this second one. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. Think about stones in soil. How much can things really grow in that area? It's very difficult. It, something can grow there re really quickly, but it, it can't, you can't sustain it because it doesn't have a deep root. Now check this out. He says, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. So many Christians are in this camp where they heard the gospel, they, they received it with joy. It was such good news. And, and, and they grew for a little bit, but they didn't have deep roots in the word of God. And so they endured only for a little time. Now check this out. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for what? For the word's sake. What happens? Immediately they stumble. I looked up that word stumble, and it means to be offended. Offense in the heart of a believer is like stones in soil. The devil uses offense to steal the word of God from people's hearts. Offense will actually stop you from being a fruitful Christian. That, that's why offense is nothing to play with. Over the years, our pastor taught us to always guard our hearts. And there were some times where we went through some very difficult, trying seasons. Some of these lasted a long time. And all the while, just remembered that word, protect our heart. Keep it pure. Make sure there's no offense that we hold towards somebody. Because it will keep you from growing. It will keep you from producing fruit. You know, spiritually mature people, they will be able to 
forgive other people without an apology. We live in a society where people feel entitled to things. Well, they owe me an apology. And it's a very revengeful culture and society now where people take things in, into their own hands. They take matters into their own hands and they look for venge, vengeance. But how many of you know that's not the Christian way? And when people get offended, do you know what they do? They try to go to all their friends to build a case to turn everybody against that person. Am I right or am I right? They build a case. And then they constantly talk about the offense. But when you constantly talk about the offense, it, it's, like, it's like picking a scab on a wound. It, it, it's, it's a seed of bitterness it is, is in the heart. There's a root of bitterness in the heart. Now we have to come to the place as Christians where we learn to let things go. Amen. I think about Jesus and what he did on the cross. The Bible says in Luke chapter 23 and verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. This is the creator of heaven and earth. And here's mankind brutally torturing him and then nailing him to a cross. Now, if I was God, and I'm not, by the way, but if I was God, I would have done what the Bible said that Jesus could have done, called down a legion of angels to come and absolutely destroy these people who had just crucified. Are you with me? But Jesus looked at them and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We have to forgive people. The Bible says in Ephesians, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The Lord wants to bring you and I to a place where we have an unoffendable heart. When he can get us there, then we're in a position where we can be used by God. Because I'm going to tell you this, when, when you begin to delve into ministry, people will offend you all the time. Welcome to ministry. Amen. But we have to forgive. Let things go. Jesus said this, that if we don't forgive people when they sin against us, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us when we sin against Him. I don't know what that spells out for you. But to me, it sounds like you're not entering into heaven. It's a big deal. Amen. Hey there, I want to personally invite you to prayerfully consider partnering with this ministry. If these teachings have been a blessing to you and stirred you up, then I want to encourage you to jump on board and become a weekly or monthly supporter. To support Revival Missions, simply go to our website at jeremyfontenot.com. The link will be posted in the description, and there you'll find several ways to give. You can give via PayPal, via tithe.ly, or you can send an old-fashioned check in the mail. And uh, I want to say... Thank you in advance for partnering with us to see the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of God.